okay guys so let's talk about containers what is a container right so uh, what is a container mm. container is basically a way of running your application in in much much easily than managing a lot of traditional stuff right that's that's what in single definition so uh, basically rather than running your application onto the server that is what we have been doing so far we wanted to run our coit front end application for that we needed apache we needed the build folder to be copied to apache configure apache open the port number 80 so we want to do a bunch of things for the application to become ready and be able to serve to people or you think about think about your our java application how did we serve our java application to people first of all we had to install uh we we got the jar file we 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 need now we need a machine to run this jar file and the machine must have java installed in it so you have to install java then you will execute the jar file inside the machine at the same time making sure that port number 8080 is open or whatever other settings that needs to be done you you would do that and similarly for the python application when we wanted to run the python application on a server first we had to install all the python modules in it we should install python software in it and then we should execute the python program and the port number 5000 should be enabled so a bunch of things you have to do right so installing softwares or running software directly inside a machine has its complication you have to manage your software and also you have to manage those machines right the most machines can go down the machine can be unstable you might want to add more machine right based on your requirements so there are a lot of operational complexity that you have to go through if you are managing your application on on a server right i mean these are real pain point problem that people are facing inside the companies right they are pain point problems and and then you know what is the solution or probably there is no 100% solution to that problem as long as the software is there and as long as it is complicated your work will also be complicated but what would be a potential solution that would minimize these operational complexities and that is where today one of that best solution is you know develop your application inside containers run them as containers you know use containers for managing your application that is one of the best way to solve this problem so i will tell you what is a container i'll tell you what is a container so when you develop your application in a container remember it's not just the application that you are developing it is the entire application infrastructure that you are developing along for example when i talk about the front end application front end software you know first of all you should have apache you should have the build folder to be copied in the www html you want to make sure that apache is running right these many things that you have to take care and you take care of that uh, inside a container so uh, you, your company develop the container rather than simply developing the build folder think about that right rather than developing the build folder your company started developing such kind of containers and these containers are ready to run anywhere right it could be it could be a server or it could be a laptop or it could be in the cloud or it could be in the premise right oh, as long as there is a server that is available you now this container can run anywhere right inside a developer laptop inside a qa engineer laptop inside any server in the cloud no it can run and you don't have to worry about installing apache inside these machines right in order to run front end you need apache so should you install apache inside the machines no you don't have to worry about that part because apache is already there inside your mm-hmm. container right apache is already there inside the container so all you have to do is this container has everything that your front end application need you just copy the container in whichever machine that you want to copy if you want to run more than one container yes go ahead and run more than container in each machine there is absolutely no problem so once you develop your application as containers this container you will develop in such a way that this container consists of your application 
and everything that your application need including apache java python or whatever your requirements are you put them together inside the same container now this container is independent your application can run independently on any machine in the world which is capable to run a container nowadays most of the machines even by default many machines are capable to run a container if it is not capable you know you can install software such as docker to inside the machine and then any machine that has docker installed they can run all these containers docker or there are many other tools for that to do in that so this is the whole point you nowadays the companies develop applications in containers and run containers when they want to run the application so they don't have to worry about these machines in the underneath right they don't have to worry about installing the machine managing the machine monitoring health, health you know taking care of their healthiness uh, uptime right all these things you know you can forget about it and you can simply focus on your containers and then you know uh, to run the containers inside the machine most of the time it is automated nowadays and sometimes you can do it manually also if you want to do maybe inside a laptop you can create the containers by running a command right but in production systems it's automated so so basically these things can move around right these things can move around from one server to other without affecting because these containers are independent of the machine where it is running it could be a cloud server it could be an on premise server it could be a developer laptop it could be your qa engineer laptop yes when you work on a project there are many places you want to run the software your qa engineer your developer uh, want the help from another developer there are two developer in a team one developer made some code change and he developed the container now he want a second developer to review his changes so he will uh, copy this container i mean he will give this container to the second developer the second developer will run the container on his laptop then the software started running on his laptop so so the, the second developer don't have to go through any complexities of installing apache copying the build folder and uh, such kind of complicated things so the developer does not have to do he just got a ready to run container from the first developer he started running that container in his laptop then he can see the software running in his laptop there is no need to uh, install any manual right of go through any manual process of installing the software he can do the testing he can give the feedback to the first developer now a qa engineer on his laptop he want to run the software so a copy of the container get created in his laptop and that's it the qa engineer got the software running on the laptop and later on you decided that you want to run the software in the cloud inside aws or inside google cloud right you created some machines uh, and in those machines you want to run it so what what did you do you again create some machines in the cloud then copy the containers over there your software started running there the whole point is that the entire software and infrastructure development happens only once and the same container will run elsewhere right uh, you want to run it in developer laptop qa engineer laptop for testing you want to run them inside uh, some cloud server jenkin server for testing finally you want to run those containers your applications in production so it would be the same container that will go to laptops to the qa environment until the production so you get all this kind of flexibility if you have such kind of containers right so that's why containers are awesome right containers are awesome and all your microservices for it front end is one container for it back end is another container for it back end two is another container so once your company started developing the containers then you know, then you would be working all around the containers uh, rather than working directly on to the surveys and uh, you know going through lot of operational complexities that each of this cloud provider has the service how the laptop has the operating system right uh, the, or even how to manage all such kind of things you can focus on creating and managing your containers if there's some error in the container you fix the problem create a new container the new container will have that problem fixed then you want to your developer want to add a new feature he will do the coding he develop the new feature then the new feature he will add to the next container so like that you know the development will happen inside the container there is no other changes the developer will keep developing but as soon as they develop the software you know it would be 
it would result in a new container consisting of the latest code so that way that way you you focus on developing and managing the containers then then a lot of things will improve inside your company you get a standard environment everywhere in right you don't have to worry it's the same container and you mentioned the apache version your software library software binaries dependencies versions everything you put together inside a container so you don't have to worry that developer install a different version and then in the qa server it is a different version in production it's a different version this happens a lot inside the company right a software work in developer laptop it doesn't work in production right so such kind of problem happens a lot because the environments are different environments are added here uh, the software version is 1.0.0 so some dependency version is this here it is 1.1 so and here it could be 1.2 so this kind of problem will never happen if you are using the same container everywhere right so that is another big advantage a lot of advantages i just listed only few of them and if you are using containers then things are pretty easy but the pain point problem arises there who will create the container so that is an extra workload right you your developer has to develop the application and they also how to develop the containers that is an extra load for them right you want to uh, whenever the developer modify the code you want to create a new container then you want to run the container in order to run the container you need docker or you need some you know run time so uh, when you when you company decided to use containers again you have to start managing the container again some operational complexity arises and you know creating containers managing container running containers running containers in various environment in your company in developer laptops in cloud in production in many places you want to run it so so uh, how how you are going to manage that uh, we will we'll talk about that a little bit we'll talk a little bit about the container history we'll talk a little bit about you no know, what are the tools and technologies available to manage the containers more efficiently today so that's what we'll talk about next so let's talk about the container management right how do you manage the containers and uh, before that let me talk a little bit about history of the containers so when when this container feature was available on linux let's talk about linux so linux operating system was invented very very long time ago and then when uh, you know linux started supporting the containers that's also happened a very very long time ago i think at least not uh, 20 years or more and the container concept were there in linux uh, linux has c groups and namespaces concepts that allows you to technically you know uh, create isolated spaces where your application can run isolated containers where your applications can run so there are various methods within linux that allows you to you know uh, isolate the process right isolate the process and also the volume networking settings and things like that everything can be isolated and then put them together inside a container and it was possible for a very very long time and but why people were not using containers then right because uh, you know that the container become popular very recently maybe in the last 10 years even less less six seven years you know, on the you know it, it has actually become much popular but before that you know people were not using containers because uh, creating containers was not very easy back then uh, yes linux supported containers but there was no uh, software to manage them right i mean easily manage them so you have to go through a lot of complicated manual process if you want to create and run containers so that made things worthless right uh, so if you want to move to container you need to get the benefit right but but you know uh, when creating the container is adding lot of operational complexity people will be hesitant to move to containers right so you have to manually create the c group name spaces isolate your processes then uh, the data storage then you know various other networks you want to isolate them and it it was a big headache in the initial days and that is why it's why containers were not very popular because people didn't want to use container because it's it's adding more complexity than reducing the complexity so that was the case and then docker docker is the company who started bringing a lot of tools 
that made things easy to manage the containers so always remember docker is not the people who invented containers containers were always there on linux but docker made things much easy docker has various developed a lot of libraries and binaries and those tools whatever docker developed can be used for creating containers very easily and you know those tools can run containers after creating the container you want to run your application as containers so you want to run your applications uh, it it you know there are tools available that helps you do that and you want to share various resources uh, the volume data storage network right every application needs some place there where they want to store the data every application needs some network settings so that they can talk to the other containers so you needed such kind of networking volume settings also so docker has implemented a wide variety of services that supported uh, managing the storage managing the network much easily then no in a in a cluster environment sometimes you you want your containers to be running across multiple machines one machine is not sufficient to run all your containers most of the time depending on the load you want a lot of machine to be created right a lot of uh, cloud machines or otherwise you know the container can run anywhere but you know there should be a machine to run the container so probably your company need you know 100 or 1000 or 10000 machines and you know uh, you are whatever container that your company is running you want those containers to be running across multiple machines so when different containers are talk, running in multiple machines how these containers will talk to each other right that is again that was another problem so if there were multiple machines and many containers running in each one of these machines how those containers will communicate how a container will talk to the container within the same machine or how a container will speak to a container which is in a different machine so how those communication work so docker also brought a lot of clustering tool that allows you to run a containers on a cluster mode right it doesn't matter uh, if the containers are running on the same machine or multiple machines they can still talk to each other using some internal network that the underlying machine provides and you know docker made use of those uh, some software networking uh, that allows you know that is integrated with the underlying hardware network so that the container at the end they can talk to each other just like you know two applications in traditional environment talk to each other every container get their own ip it doesn't matter where they are sitting in they could be sitting in one machine or several they all get their own ip address and they all can talk to each other uh, with also docker has brought in a lot of software tools libraries which made things much much easier and you know they showed us the path this is how you should use containers and this is how you should manage your containers this is how you should develop your containers this is how you should run your container in a single machine or multiple machine or inside a cluster so a lot of tools were brought in and 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 that showed us the light right i mean docker is actually the uh, people who showed us the light on how you should put your application inside the containers and use them and you know uh, solve most of the pain point problem that you would face when you are using containers so that is where it all started people started using containers and nowadays docker is slowly disappearing from the picture unfortunately there are better tools today that can manage containers than docker uh, but but you know th- this is this is the slight little bit history about uh, how things become easy how people started thinking about containers how people really considered con- containers as the right solution to all the pain point problem that they are facing while managing a software right managing software application so uh, most of the pain point problem have been addressed by docker and then uh, by with kubernetes and many other tools which are today available on the market the problem has reduced to a very very minimal level and containers are the best way to manage your software applications today
that I'm going to do next. Uh, so we are going to use Apache. There are many web surveys available, Apache and Genex, various web surveys. They are free, they are open source. Anyone in the world can install it. And then that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to install Apache inside my AWS machine. So I will log into my AWS machine first. And then after that, I will set up the machine. I will install Apache inside the machine. And then that is a web server software which I am installing. And this software is special. It is capable to listen to the browsers who connect to your AWS machine on port number 80. So I am inside the AWS machine and I'm going to do this. First, I will run the apt-get update command and then I will run the apt-get install command. So I want to install Apache. First, I will search in Google. I don't know what is the Ubuntu package. I always search in Google first before deciding what package name. So it's Apache 2, right? I told you sometimes the software name and package name can be different in case of a software, it's Apache. But the package name is Apache 2. So always search in Google to confirm. Uh, you can get that information from directly by going to this website also, packages.ubuntu.com. Uh, but yeah, uh, Google search would give you the correct result in the first page itself. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to install Apache inside my AWS machine. So that's the process that is currently happening. And Apache is now being installed. So what is Apache? Apache is a web server software that I am currently installing inside my AWS machine. And what this web server software is capable of, once you started the Apache service, it will listen on port number 80. Now any browser all over the world can talk to this machine on port 80 and then, then Apache can, Apache is a software, you can assume Apache to be a software running inside the machine. It can see if any browser connects to port 80 and then it can do what you ask it to do. So that's what I'm going to do next after installing Apache. I want to tell Apache to serve the build folder to people, right? Anybody who requested for uh, uh, anybody who connect on port 80 of this web server, this is the folder that you want to serve to them. And in order to do that, you know, uh, you have to copy the build folder to the Apache folder, www HTML. This is the document root of Apache by default. By default, this is the folder Apache will be serving to the people. So right now the build folder is sitting somewhere else. I will copy that build folder to this folder. This is the Apache document root by default. So once I did that, you know, from now the build folder content would be there in Apache. Then Apache would be serving that content to the people whoever is browsing. So anyone who is browsing, now they will see the front end application in their browser. So that is exactly what I want to do. I want to install Apache. I already have. Now I want to tell Apache, hey, uh, serve the build folder content to people. And how do I do that? I copy the content of the build folder to the WW HTML and let me do that. So uh, Apache is installed and I'm going to start Apache. Apache service need to be started. Uh, after installing the command is service space Apache to space start. This is the command that you use to start any service in Linux. Uh, in my particular case, I started Apache. Now, uh, where is my build folder? My build folder is here yesterday. In the last session, we created the build folder. And this is the one, the build folder over here. I want to copy the whole content of the build folder to the WW HTML. So before that, first of all, let me go to the WW HTML. And it contains some sample file. I'm going to delete it. By default, you know, it would contain some content. I deleted that file. I don't need anything inside the WW HTML, but the build folder. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy the build folder CP minus R. Uh, if you want to recursively copy, including the folder, uh, the command is minus R. CP minus R slash root quite friend and quite friend and, and the build. So this is the folder. I mean, I don't want to copy the entire folder. I want to copy the content of the folder. So slash star means everything which come under the build folder. So I'm copying the build folder content. Every content of the build folder I'm copying to. What is the destination? WW HTML. You already know the CP command, right? CP command will copy everything from source to the destination. So 
once you executed this command now i am inside what ww html and all the build folder content has come here so it's done it's done so what you did is you installed apache after installing apache you copy the build folder to the apache root folder which is what ww html now apache is ready to serve the files to the people whoever is requesting apache is ready to serve this website to the people so let's see let's see that but before doing that there are certain other thing also that you need to do technically i will tell you what needs to be done um now now everything is ready all configurations are done from the apache side now anyone in the world ever speak to port 80 of your aws machine using their browser they will see the front end application apache will be serving the front end application to them so this is what the current situation is but but there is one problem actually uh, when people try to connect to port 80 aws don't allow them to talk to port 80 aws block port 80 by default so you, you should allow port number 80 you want to tell aws hey please allow all connections coming to this machine on 80 i want 80 port to be public so uh, aws has some security settings that stops people to talk to port 80 of the aws machine i'm going to change that settings now right so that uh, people all over the world now can start speaking to port 80 of your aws machine so let me make some adjustment on the aws side so now now i want to run a container I, I just want to run a container and i want to show you right so when i say container i'm just talking about your containerized application so it could be apache process that you want to run or it could be java minus jar space jar file it would be that command that you want to run or it could be python 3 space python program right so basically the what is the purpose of the container the purpose of the container is to run your process the process can be apache process can be java minus jar then the jar file or the process can be python 3 space the python program right uh, the point what i'm trying to make here is that why you need containers you need containers to run your application and the application run as a single process so uh, that's what you did right even if you are using traditional environment it's only apache that you need inside your front end container it's the java minus jar space jar file that's the process that you need to run the java application when it comes to the python application so always uh, whatever your application you are developing in your company you start that application with a command and that application run in the foreground and and that's how you use that software right so so uh, so always remember that fact containers are not a fantasy or something that you must have you need the container because you want to run your application process right and so it's also called a startup program uh, what that means is what you want to run inside a container your company would be developing various containers one container for the front and one container for the java application another container for python another container for the shopping cart prime customer you have various application in your company and every applications are started using a command right right that's you can call it a startup command or the command that initiate your application and you want to run that command inside a container right or in other words you want to run your application inside the container and that is why you need containers always remember that right just don't try to learn containers uh, uh, remember just i mean uh, you know what i mean you need the container when you want to run the application and if your application you don't want to run your application you don't need containers if your application got crashed the container does not need to stay anymore and the container can also crash right there is no need for the container to stay if your application crashed or your application finished executing so apache run forever java minus jar command run forever python 3 command run forever so your uh, application will run forever so your container has to run forever of course true uh, true true story but that may not be the case all the time so assume uh, sometimes what your application want to do is it want to it want to take a excel file read the data from the excel file write the data into some database into some other storage so assume that is what your application is doing 
So your application, when you start your application, it will look for an Excel sheet. Take the Excel sheet. It consists of some one lakh lines in it. It will read each and every line. Put those lines inside a database. Then it process each and every line one by one and assume it process all the one lakh lines inside the Excel sheet. Then no, once there is not line left to execute, your program will exit, right? I mean, you are done. You are done. You process the entire Excel sheet and you are done. So in that case, in that case, do you need the container to stay? No, the container can get deleted, the container can get stopped or no, the container does not need to be running anymore if my application is not running, right? So always remember, when you start a container, it can be a temporary container or it can be a permanent container. But the container needs to stay just to run your application. If your application is not running anymore, there is no reason for your container to stay. It can get stopped, it may get terminated and you don't care. You see the point? So always keep this in mind. This is why you are running your container. So if you are in the future, you are developing few containers, you are developing a front-end container, you are developing a Java container, you are developing a Python container. Why you are developing them? Because you want to, in the first container, you want to run Apache. In the second container, you want to run Java minus jar, uh, jar file. In the third container, you want to run your Python program. That's why they are running. And if those programs are not running anymore, there is no need for the container to stay. So, a startup program decide the state of the container, whether the container should stay or whether the container should get stopped. It is decided by its startup program. In case of the front-end container, the startup program could be Apache CTL minus D foreground. This is the command that you can use to start Apache in the foreground. Yes, service Apache command will also work, but this is not the right command because this command don't stay after starting Apache. This command start Apache in the background. So that's why instead of service Apache start, this is the command that I want to use to start Apache. Uh, you want to use the command that run in the foreground. So uh, this command will start Apache. So as long as this command stays, Apache stays, your container stays. If this Apache crashed or this command crashed, the container can get stopped, right? I don't care. Similarly, for the Java application, Java minus jar, then you know your jar file, whatever your jar file is, right? So this is the command I want to run. And if this command ever get finished, then or uh, maybe due to some reason the command got crashed or due to some error, something got crashed, the program got crashed, then is there a reason for the container to stay? No, the container may be stopped. And the same thing for my Python, so Python 3 space, you know, whatever my Python program is, right? So just, the, so there is a reason why your containers are staying, they, they run your startup program. So you, whatever container that you develop, it must have a startup program. And you should configure that uh, startup program in such a way that if there is a problem, the startup program will crash then your container will also crash. That is how the container runtime behave. It will watch for the startup command. If the command ever crash, container will also crash. And you should make sure that your container get crashed. Actually, right? So uh, the container should not stay after your program got crashed. So that is why you should you know, uh, use some foreground command uh, and you should set that as the uh, startup program of your container so that automatically it crashes. Uh, container crashes when your program crash because otherwise that container will stay and it become unmanaged then it would become a huge responsibility to clean them up in a future stage and you know a lot of problem can happen every day so a lot of a lot of container will get residue and you know cleaning up is a complicated job so you should make sure that your application crashes the container should also stop that's important uh, and, and yeah, so with that, with that, keeping that in mind, let's, let's start running some containers. That's what we are going to do next. So, so we just discussed about the startup program and now let's, let's run a container and that's what we are going to do. Let's, let's run a container next. So running containers. Sample containers. That's what I'm. So running containers.
in sample containers that's what i'm doing i'm going to run some sample containers so uh, so i'm just uh, let me do that i'm going to do that i'll just go to the command line and i'm going to execute a command so the machine already have docker installed so this machine is now capable to run containers and that's what exactly what i'm doing i'm going to run a container i'm going to execute a single command called docker run point learning slash point front end column latest i'll tell you what it is and uh, maybe i will also do i want after running this container this container will run inside my aws machine i want to expose this container to the outside world on port number 80 so anybody who connect on my aws machine you know with this minus p option you put then the container would become available to to the outside world uh, people can browse the aws machine ip you can see the container uh, on their browser containerized application on their browser so i'm just creating a container and in order to create a container the command is docker run docker run is the command to create a container and then while creating the container you have to specify a container image that you want to use this this is a docker image docker i'll tell you what is a docker image a container image is nothing but a backup of a container and this uh, for now you just assume this is a existing file pre-existing file sitting somewhere on the internet it's sitting somewhere on the internet and this file consists of uh, my code front and application the build folder apache then apache in the build folder and also some startup program when i run a container right now that's what i'm doing i'm going to create a container using docker run command docker run is what you use to create a container and when i create a container a startup program will run inside the container and that settings is also mentioned inside this image so just you know uh, forget about everything i'm just trying to create a container so my first container i'm creating my first container and it is telling me it's unable to find the image locally so this is the image from which the container to be created and it looks like this container is not there locally and it looks like it's trying to pull the image from somewhere from somewhere from the internet it is download has downloaded an image so that is the docker run command did for the first time first time when you run this command it check if this container image is already available or not if it is available it will go ahead and create the container if it is not available it is downloading that container image from somewhere okay fine let's let it be uh, so some image got downloaded and then then some commands are getting executed the startup programs is getting executed and looks like it is nginx command so this is not running apache this is running engine apache or nginx it's the same so um in my particular case so uh, technically what is happening in the background it is uh, starting nginx as the web server and nginx is currently running so so i will draw this up so on on the aws machine that i have just created i was trying to create a container i was trying to create a container so what i did is i already installed docker inside the machine and i just executed the docker run command then i mentioned some image image name to be used while creating the container so this is the command i executed to create a container another container got created inside the machine and inside the container you no know, looks like some nginx command got executed and you know it seems like from the output i can see nginx is running right nginx is started nginx is running and you know uh, uh, nginx is similar to apache so also replace apache with nginx right from today so uh, apache or nginx both are similar right don't worry so uh, uh, inside the container nginx process is now running that is the startup program it all do every time you create a container it will have a startup program and where this container got created from from an image from an image the containers are always created from an image and the image should be present within the machine and if it is not present within the machine the image will be downloaded from some registry some registry some place on the internet 
and that is where the container images are kept maybe every company uses registry as the single place to store the container images it may consist of various images shopping cart image for fronted image backend image java image python image uh, all your application your company containerized it and you, they are kept inside a container registry and then uh, when you execute the docker run command uh, no the image automatically gets downloaded from the registry if it is already not there locally right so it get downloaded automatically so what i did is in my case i all i did is i just executed one single command called docker run and i mentioned which image i want to use and first it checked for the image locally it was not there locally it downloaded from some registry and then from that image it started a container and at the time of starting the container you know it executed some startup program the startup program whatever the program is is configured predefined inside the image which we will discuss later how to develop an image and things like that we will discuss later but yeah what happened is now my container is running the nginx process nginx is running inside the container container is in running state it's healthy it is running nginx and nginx is ready to serve my build folder to people nginx just like apache the nginx also listen on port number 80 so anybody who connect to this container they can see the web page so that's what i'm going to do using my browser uh, from my laptop i am sitting in bangalore and i am going to connect to this container and the container is running inside your aws machine but but since i had added some port forwarding settings a minus p option over here since i have added this port forwarding settings this container whatever got created just now it is exposed to the outside world using port 80 So uh, minus P option says port 80 of the host machine should be forwarded to port 80 of the container. Or in other words, anyone in the world who connect to the host machine, that is my AWS machine, somebody connect to my AWS machine on port number 80, automatically the request will go to the container on port 80. That is what I mean by two 80s over there. I put right. I put two 80s. The first 80 indicate that uh, you know the Uh, request on the host port on the aws machine this one is the container so whatever request coming to port 80 of aws will automatically go to the container 80 and then the container is now ready it's running in genx let's see let's try to browse let's try to browse for your aws machines public ip not just me except since it is a public ip anyone in the world can browse and whoever is browsing their browser will speak to port 80 of my aws machine and you know the rest of the things what will happen right so anyone browse it what will happen their browser will speak to my aws machine on port 80 the request will forward to the container on port 80 because i use the minus p switch now now i would see i will talk to nginx my browser will speak to nginx running inside the container and then nginx will respond to me with a web page and let's see if it is happening yes it is happening and you know inside the nginx i put a different message on my application so right previously it was enter a message now it is input your message so of course just just to demonstrate that two are different i i change the message uh, whatever so this page is coming from the container not from the machines right remember i did an install apache i did an install nginx i did an install anything inside the aws machine everything i am expecting that it's there in the container and looks like it's true it was there in the container and the container is giving me what i wanted so 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 ultimately uh, technically in the background what i did is i run the same coit fronter application inside inside the aws machine but this time as a container right nothing i am running inside the aws i am not running apache i didn't copy the build folder i didn't do anything inside the aws machine all i did is i just executed a container and this container i it already has nginx installed in it it already has build folder copied to the document root of nginx and then uh, nginx got started when the container got created so all these settings are mentioned inside the image nginx installation the build folder and the nginx document root will folder is nginx document root then now uh, the some startup command right uh, maybe it's nginx command or whatever command that you want 
the container to run that is a predefined settings in the image so as soon as the container got created everything got configured and everything is ready now your application is ready to serve to people so your work is simplified right with a single docker run command i started running my application and but make sure that you have created the image we will talk about that process later yes you should create an image and um, uh, so image has to be there and from the image you want to create the container so uh, how you create this image right what you have is a build folder uh, in, in developer laptop right uh, so after running the npm install or npm run build command you get the build folder so you have the build folder but how you will develop a container that that we'll discuss later in the next session uh, and how you will store the container in a registry so that it is downloadable by the people and uh, those things you will discuss later but yeah uh, always remember containers are always created from an image and image is nothing but a backup of a container and in our particular case uh, the coit trender image it consists of uh, nginx software installed in it it consists of the build folder in the nginx document root and it also specifies the startup program you know what that means is what command container will run so all these things are predefined inside the image and images are containers are always created from an image and then uh, you should configure your application in such a way that as soon as the container start up your application start running and yeah yeah so this these are this is the way how you run a container inside a machine and we we did that successfully and great about the container registry so uh, the container registry we already discussed um, in the last session that when we try to create a container uh, normally the container image right the image from which the container is created the image could be either stored inside um, inside uh, inside your laptop i mean inside lockery that means in the docker host or it could be in the registry and then uh, it is possible that you know uh, as a engineer or uh, your ci cd system or some automated system or it could be your engineer they have the ability to download the image from the registry or upload an image to the registry so basically it's called push and pull uh, anyone any developer from his laptop he can push an image to a registry so a registry is nothing but a central place that a company uses to store their container images right so uh, every company should have such a registry because the companies are managing a lot of applications various different different applications and all these applications they want to create the container images right every company has to develop such kind of container images and then after developing such kind of container images all these container you want to place them inside a central location and this is needed for every company it is inside this location you want to store the images and distribute the images to various systems right all these docker images you want to share with other people in your company so that's why and there should be enough you know uh, you you should make sure that uh, whatever container image that your company develop you know some container images are unstable some container images may be stable right uh, every time developer develop something it it is considered as unstable because that need to undergo a lot of testing so there may be unstable images uploaded by the developers from a unstable code or there may be stable images uh, you know uh, that is that is that images has finished all kind of testing and they are ready to go to production there can be various type of images of the same application maybe if you consider the coit front end there may be something called coit front end dev image for example coit front end dev this could be an image that is not stable that is developed from an unstable code so you can call it a unstable image or you know it could be a stable image something like coit front end 1.0.0 so the version is 1.0.0 so this is an image that is tested properly this of uh, image container is working absolutely fine everything is stable uh, customer did not face any problem right it's a stable image and this image can be you can run containers in your production machines and you can this can serve your customer directly 
uh, the application running inside these images are stable application here uh, you now they need to undergo more and more testing so uh, there are various people and various systems inside your company maybe the developers or maybe your ci cd systems or some automated jenkins server all these server want to take this image maybe the image that is unstable and uh, you know they want to probably do some testing make sure that everything works fine and then you know uh, at the end uh, all the testing is done then the problems are fixed by the developer and then uh, probably your company created a final stable image then you know maybe uh, your developers or maybe your ci cd systems after it the final stable image is developed it want to push that image into the registry again and now this uh, image is stored permanently inside the registry and then uh, it is marked as 1.0.0 then it may go to your customer or you can uh, execute this container in your customer service then then it should work you know uh, there should not be any problem for your customers so like that you know you want to do a lot of such of things and basically when i talk about uh the service it could be docker host or it could be a kubernetes cluster various various places where you want to create containers the companies create containers uh, maybe inside a container host directly or inside inside um inside a kubernetes cluster so you want to create containers here so this image need to be downloaded here right into the kubernetes cluster or into some machine state right, where you want to run the containers so the point what i am trying to make here is that there are a lot of people or lot of systems inside your company who want to store container images in the registry or they want to download the container images from the registry so that is why having a registry is very very important it could be in the cloud right you can uh, it could be in the cloud you, you you have this registry storage and you will keep on pushing and pulling images to the registry and then you know your various people in your team various systems in your company that you configured automated systems they all want to push and pull container images uh, to the registry and that is very very important all right so that's why the importance of a container registry great naming your container images right that's what i'm going to talk about next so how you will name your container images so basically you know it's up to you what what name that you want to give to a container image you can name it it's up to you there is no uh, problem in doing that so uh, when you develop a container image all by yourself in your laptop assume assume you are a developer and you know your company has a container registry and assume you are a developer or some automated system in your company it can be anything so you are developing a container image in your laptop or you are managing a container image in your laptop so remember container image can be either in the registry or in your laptop right or in your laptop and if it is in your laptop you can call it with any name you want for example maybe you can call it with the same application name uh, with some tag let's say dev or something like that coit front end dev this is how you can call the image locally and then every time you create a container you can use the command docker run then followed by the name of the image right coit front end dev so uh, this is the case if you have this image stored locally within the machine right this is a machine that has docker installed and inside the machine the image is available and then you know it's up to you you can call the image whatever name that you want to call it that's okay and later you know you are an engineer or you are uh, sitting uh, in your in your home or in your office and now this image need to be pushed to a registry right the same image that the developer developed assume this image is developed by the developer himself we will talk about how to develop it don't worry but assume there is an image that a developer has in his laptop and this is the name that he call it locally and later he want this image to be pushed to the registry so in that case you know you there is a naming format that you need to adapt and the naming format will look something like this let me let me draw this you know the naming format will be something like this um uh, the registry url slash registry url is generally a dns name that identify the registry so it could be 
uh, it could be you know uh, a url right like google.com or something like that so it's a url then slash then optionally you know you can specify some other names for example some id generally it could be some unique id it all depends on the kind of registry that you are using so it could be you know for example basil or you know it can be anything quite slash then you can specify uh, the name of the repository so let's say coit shandan colon dev so this is how the name has to look like now this is how you should name it before this image may be stored inside the registry right uh, because this is the naming syntax that the registry follows right whatever image in the same image of course that you have locally but when you push to the registry you should be pushing with this particular name and that is important so uh, what a developer when uh, assume the developer want to push this image from his local uh, to the remote you know, there is a command that he will use the command is docker push but before he push it he will rename the docker image with with this you know something like this the registry url slash coit uh, coit or whatever i mean whatever your company name is or whatever your project name is it can be you know uh, uh, some unique name depending on your uh, provider registry provider and then uh, then you can use the docker push command first you will rename the file uh, to this and then you can use the docker push command to push this container image to the remote registry so this is what you can do uh, as a as a devops engineer these are the commands that you can use so, but uh, always remember this is how the naming of a image when you store it in the registry right and if a developer want to store this in a registry first he should name the image like this and then he should push it then automatically uh docker identify where you want to push it and af- assume if you do not push anything if you don't specify anything by default it will take docker.io so there is a official registry for docker uh, it's called hub.docker.com you can browse it you can see all the images there by browsing for hub.docker.com let me show you hub.docker.com it it is a website you can browse and it consists of you know over 8 million container images if you click on the explore button you can see a lot of images over 9 million uh, container images are available in here uh, the alpine uh, my python ubuntu postgres redis there are a lot of pre existing images available inside the registry and then this registry is uh, registry url is docker.io so um, and and then then within this hub.docker.com assume assume you are using hub.docker.com as your registry in that case you can register for free you can all of you can do this actually you can go to the website hub.docker.com and then you can register for yourself by clicking this register button provide a docker id email id and password docker id can be nothing but your name it should be unique and then that would become your docker id so in that case you know uh, so i am taking the example of hub.docker.com then the url of the registry would become something like this right it would become um uh, hub.docker.io that is the host name for hub.docker.com and then slash you have to specify no the name of your docker id when you create an account at hub.docker.com you have to create a docker id so assume this is your docker id in that case this is how you know you name your image inside the hub.docker.com i'm talking about the special case of hub.docker.com but remember hub.docker.com is just one of the registry providers there are many others like uh, hub.docker.com there is google cloud container registry Uh, AWS container registry uh, most of the cloud provider has their own container registry some companies want to set up and manage their own registry they will set up a server and they will set up a registry themselves using some software so there are many registry solutions available and it's up to the company to choose what they want uh, hub.docker.com is the default one if you don't use anything it would be considered as hub.docker.com and also even if you don't put docker io here in the beginning of the url if you simply put your docker id slash container image still you know uh, all the system will assume that it is docker io right 
by default it is docker io by default whether you are using docker whether you are using kubernetes whether you are using any container tools uh, if you call this image with this name uh, you did not provide any registry url it will assume it's hub.docker.com or docker.io so always remember this docker.io or hub.docker.com uh, is the default registry that most of the tools today consider to be default right but uh, it's up to you uh, later you know your company is using google cloud container registry then gcr.io or asia.gcr.io so this is the registry url for google cloud and then you can specify your google cloud project name when you create a google cloud project you will get some project name right uh, if you are not new, new to google cloud don't worry about it but you have a unique name right and then you will specify your container image so this can be the case uh, of a google cloud container registry if it is aws you will get your own url when you create a registry you will get your own url so your own url slash then your aws uh, you know or and then you can specify your uh, direct container name this is also possible so, uh, so it depends on the registry provider the url will vary but the common syntax is there would be a registry url followed by an optional name followed by your repository i mean followed by your image so this is how the naming will look like and a developer from his laptop he will first name the image based on the company so if your company is using hub.docker.com you should uh, you know you should, should specify image uh, docker.io slash and then uh, your docker id whatever your docker id is slash then your name so if it is quite random so you will first rename it uh, to like this before you push them and then docker will automatically identify where it should be pushed right it automatically identify using this name so this is this is the naming syntax right naming a convention of a container image look like if it is local it's up to the developer he can name it whatever way he want and if it is on the registry he want to push it to the registry he should name it with a with a proper address right with a complete name and this is the naming syntax available and by default uh, if you didn't provide any name it would assume docker.io always everywhere you know all all systems all softwares nowadays they consider docker.io to be the default registry make it not great Now, now let's talk about some Docker commands to manage the images. So, uh, container image, right? Uh, container image can be stored locally or it could be stored remotely on a registry. And uh, so, we'll talk about some few Docker commands that a developer can run on his laptop, right? Or it could be developer or it could be some automated systems also in your company. Uh, we'll get into that. So, first, first we will talk about how to run some basic commands on your laptop, right? So let me log into the Docker host first. I already have a machine uh, that I have created in my AWS account. That is where I have been setting up stuff and I'm going to log into the machine and I'm going to Okay guys, now I am inside the docker host and I run the command docker images. There's a command called docker images that you can run. What this uh, command does is it would show you all the images, what you currently have locally. So in my particular case, this is the image that I currently have locally. And remember this image I, I downloaded in the last session when I created the container. This image was actually in the hub.docker.com and you can see the naming, right? This is my docker ID. And this is a slash coit random colon latest, uh, colon latest. Latest is the default tag of any image. If you don't put any tag name by default, it will be latest. So the actual name is uh, coit learning coit random colon latest. Or if you want to change it, uh, latest may be changed to 1.0.0. It's up to you what name that you want to tag, right? And also, uh, if you don't put docker.io, you can see there is no docker.io, but don't worry. It is docker.io uh, technically even if you don't put any registry name in the beginning by default it's docker.io and this is my uh, docker id uh, coit learning is my docker id 
everyone when you register at hub.docker.com you would get a docker id you would generate a docker id and that is this docker id slash so this is how the image will look like and it can also be called docker.io slash so this is the full name uh, if whether you call it this name or this name by default it's docker.io so that's why and and that's the that's the point so uh, and if you want to call this image locally you know this is a laptop and then uh, the local the laptop owner right or uh, they can uh, call it the name whatever they want so they can create various tags you know he want to call it simply front end right so he can do this there's a command called docker tag docker tag then uh, whatever image that he has currently then he want to call it you know from now he want to call it front end he want to simply call it front end latest so what this command does is the same image it get tagged as front end latest so developer have the flexibility to name the images so now if you run the command docker images you would actually notice uh, that it is now listing two images one is the original one the other one is the tagged one and technically they are actually same right it's the same docker image that they are pointing to you can uh, have various names like this so assume your company is using google container registry maybe you decided that you know you want to tag it you want to push the image to google container registry then what you can optionally do is whatever image that you have in local either you want to call it simply front end you can call it simply front end call front end column writers so this is the image that you currently have in local now i want to push it to registry so google cloud has this syntax gcr.io that is the registry url followed by my project at google which will have a unique name and then i want to call it quite front end column later so assume this is how i want it to be called when i push to the gcr google container registry then first i should tag in this syntax because google cloud insists that it should be tagged like this gcr.io slash my project name in google then you know whatever the image that you want so now now i created one more tag so it right all these tags are created locally now i can push let's say i want this image to be pushed to the google container registry there is a command that i can use called push push is a command to push the images from local to the registry and then it is the name that determine which registry you want to push it so if i run this command with gcr.io as the url with my project name then a registry would be pushed into the google cloud to my google cloud project or if you if you run the command docker push without gcr.io then it would get pushed into into the hub.docker.com or if you don't put you know if you put docker.io or not by default it will go to hub.docker.com so it it it's the name of the image that determines that determines how exactly uh, what is uh, what it will be called uh, right uh, uh, that's that's going to be the full name of the image that you will use later on so i can try to uh, run the push command but right now if i try i would get an error if i try now you know i am going to get an error uh, but let me try it anyway uh, i'm going to run the command docker push then you know i'm just trying to push this image to google container registry and i do not have permission to google container registry right now so i am obviously going to get some error uh, saying that you know you do not have permission to push and in order to get permission uh, you can execute the docker login command there's a docker login command that a developer can run and then it will ask him for a username and password he can provide the username and password and then he will log into the registry and then he will be able to do the pushing so let me let me try that right let me try that so right now i'm just trying to push but i'm expecting uh, i don't have permission to push to the google container registry this will end up in an error later on i will push with some credentials and then then we will see right so now i am getting some error it's saying no it's not enabled service is not enabled something right so google cloud is rejecting my access 
Uh, don't worry about that. We are not going to talk about Google Cloud today. But uh, let me do something. Uh, what I'm going to do is, I want to push this image to the the Docker Hub, hub.docker.com. So currently it's called Coit Learning, Coit Frontend Latest. I want to name it something like Coit Learning, Coit Frontend V V10 or V V15, right? I want to instead of latest, I want to give it a different name. So I will first tag it. Uh, this is my image that I have locally and then I want to tag it something like this coit learning slash coit frontend column uh, 1.0.0 or 2.0.0 or you know a uh, 10.0.0 whatever name that you want to call it so let me simply call it v15 version 15 so assume this is an image that I created and this follow the proper syntax and now if I try to push it this will get pushed into Docker Hub. But right now, if I try to push it, I won't get an error because I do not have credentials configured. So it tells me you do not have access. So first I should log into hub.docker.com and the command is Docker login. So Docker login is a command that allows you to log into a container registry. If you want to push or pull, you should have permission to the container registry. So for that, you should have a docker id and password if you do not have one you can go to the website hub.docker.com and register a docker id and then you can log into the docker id and it's free docker login command when you run it it will ask you for your docker id so my docker id is quite learning right and then it is asking me for the password which i think uh, i have yes so i entered my password and then it tells me you successfully logged into hub.docker.com now i try to push it it will get pushed into hub.docker.com the account that i have just created in hub.docker.com it got successfully pushed now if i log into hub.docker.com i would be able to see let me go to hub.docker.com let me log in using my browser this is hub.docker.com let me try to log in right you can go to the website hub.docker.com click on the login button provide your docker id and password and once you logged in, you would be able to see all the repositories, all the container images, the coit frontend image that you just pushed, you would be able to see that. Uh, so this is the one. And I am getting a message saying that last pushed few seconds ago. Looks like our push has succeeded. Just click and open it. And then now you uh, go over here, you can see V15 got pushed just now a minute ago. Uh, you know, and that's me. That's me. I pushed it from this machine by executing the docker push command so this way you can uh, first tag the image with an appropriate name and then you can use the push command to push your container images to the registry and that is how that is how it's it's done right great and if you want to pull an image uh, so there is an already an existing image in the registry that you want to pull you can use this command docker pull docker pull is the command that you can use to pull an existing registry so assume in my hub.docker.com account i already have an image uh, coit learning slash coit frontend uh, v9.0 there is something called v9.0 so i want to push pull that so i can do this i can use this command um i can use this command docker pull then v 9.0 so uh, this is an image which is currently there inside hub.docker.com now i want to pull it to my local there's a command called docker pull pull to download an image from the registry push to upload an image to the registry you may cannot so just run this command then what happens is the image get downloaded to your local and that's what currently happening and once it is downloaded you would be able to see that image every time you run the docker images command right now this image is local now you want to create a container so now i run the command docker images i can see this image is now downloaded locally i want to create a container i run the command docker run docker run minus p 80 colon 80 you already know this command this is the command that you use to create a container and now i can use this image to create a container and run this command you will notice that a container is getting created from this image and yes it's listening on port 80 it is exposed to port 80 i can go ahead and browse for uh, that port number and then you know uh, browse for the ip address then i should see the web page the code from web page it's working 
So that's the idea. This is how you can, these are the various commands that you can run locally in order to manage the container images. We discussed about the Docker images command. Docker images command will show you all the local images. Then we discussed about Docker login command that allows you to log into a container registry. Then we discussed about the Docker pull and Docker push that allows you to download or upload an image from the registry. And then we discussed about Docker tag command that will conveniently allow you to name your container image locally before you push them to a registry. So these are various commands that you can use in Docker that allows you to manage your container images. Great. Okay, guys, so uh, now we will talk about few Docker commands to manage the containers, right? So, uh, so you already know the Docker run command. That's what you use in order to create a container, right? Docker run command, you can run when you want to create a new container. So uh, then you have to specify from which Docker image you want to create the container. So Docker run command is what you use when you want to create a container. Let me, okay, what is coming? Okay, docker run command is one command uh, followed by the image name. This would create a new container. That's one option and there's a command called docker ps. Docker ps command when you execute it, it would show you all the containers that are currently running inside your machine. So in my particular case, there is one container that is currently running and every container when you start it, they would get a unique container ID and that is the identifier of a container. Every container get a unique ID. And then it would also have an image name from which image the container was created. And as you already know, every containers are started with a command. Remember, every containers are started with a command. And whatever command started the container, you can see it here. And then, you know, uh, right? Uh, so why you are running container? You want to run your application. You want to start your application inside the container. That's why, right? So every containers are started with a command. We already mentioned this in the previous session. So if it is our quite front end container, now the command could be Apache CTL minus T foreground. That would start Apache. If it is the Java application, it would be Java minus jar, then the jar file. It could be, right? So whatever container you are starting, you are uh, starting it because you want to run your application. So you start it with a command. The command can run your application. So, and then you can see the port forwarding settings and stuff. So docker ps command will list all the containers that you currently have. In my case, there's only one and I can see that. And there's a command called docker ps minus a. So uh, in the last session or yesterday, I had created few containers and they are not visible. They got stopped. So I want to see the container that are currently running. Docker ps command show you all the container that are currently running. And also the container that got stopped before. So there's a command ps minus a. ps minus a command would actually show you all the containers that are currently running and all those containers which got stopped, right? It got exited 22 hours ago yesterday, right? It got exited. So you can see all the containers that are running or not. And you know, if you want to stop a container, it is also possible. So docker ps command shows me this container is currently running. So I want to manually stop it. I want to forcefully stop it. I can execute a command called docker stop against this container ID. This container is currently in the running status. You can see it's up and running. And now I want to stop it manually. The command is docker stop. Once you executed this command, what happens is the container gets stopped. Now you run the command docker ps. There is no containers that are running. But if you run the command docker ps minus a, you can see them. This container image I just stopped. This one got stopped yesterday. So all those stopped image, sorry, containers, I am able to see. Now I am going to delete them permanently. There's a command called docker rm. Docker rm is a command that you can use to delete a container permanently. If you want to delete multiple containers, you can just put the container ID separated by space, as many container ID you want, and all the containers get deleted. And make sure that before you execute the rm command, the container should be in the exited status or stop status, right? If they are in running state, first you should docker stop command to stop it. Then you can use the docker rm command to delete it. Now it's gone permanently. Now you run the command docker ps minus a, it's not there. Docker ps, it's not there, it's gone. 
they are completely deleted from your docker host so these are various commands and then uh, let me now create a new container docker run first let me check what are the images available on my laptop so from the front end latest i'm going to create a new container docker run front end and uh, you know whether i want to put latest or not if even if i don't put latest in the image name by default it will assume latest so that is the default tag so i'm not putting latest here just for a new information for you whether if if it is status it's not mandatory that you put it right even if you don't put it it will by default assume it is latest so i'm going to use minus p option to expose it and also i'm going to use one more option minus d because i want the container to run in the background otherwise i won't get my command line back right i don't like that right i just use minus d option so same process it would create a container but in the background and you will get back your command line right container got created in the background you can see the container using docker ps command container is there but you know you got your uh, command line back so minus d option is very helpful when you use it with, along with the docker run command and now let's say when when docker create a container docker would uh, create some network settings also for the container something that i didn't tell you docker is capable to uh, set up some networking every time you create a container the container is get an ip address from a virtual network that docker created for you and then uh, you create three or four container every container would get a private ip and using that ip they can communicate each other that is also possible and docker can optionally assign some volumes storage devices from your laptop it can you know put some storage location to the container that is also possible many options are available but we are not going to learn docker in that much depth this is just for your information because we are not going to use docker a lot in our advanced training we are using different tools for that but yeah let's not uh, worry much about it but uh, the point what i'm trying to make here is that docker has a lot of other capabilities also providing the networking services providing storage services all these services docker can provide to the containers that you have just created and uh, there's a command called docker inspect if you want to check a container if you want to see the settings of a container what is the ip address what is the volume what are the different different settings of the container what is the uh, right what is the container image so a lot of information that you want to see about the container there's a command called inspect inspect followed by the container id then it would tell you what is the ip address of the container and what is the gateway setting network settings or various volume settings a lot of other settings that the container have a lot of information about the container would be printed if you executed this command docker inspect so uh, this is how you can find out what is the ip address of the container in this case 172.17.0.2 other container want to talk to this container they can use this ip it's so basically you know, a docker inspect command would show you a lot of information about a given container that's 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 what and these are few commands that you would run usually docker run right then docker ps docker ps minus a docker stop docker rm right then uh, docker inspect these are various co commands that you can use there are many others also these are various commands that you can use to manage a container locally using docker great